This is an article published in the Reformed Presbyterian in October of 1838 and continued from an earlier edition of the magazine. The article is entitled, The Doctrine of the Atonement. Theories which are not in their first principles and in all parts supported by the general tenor of scripture doctrines are unworthy the faith of Christians. They always direct the mind from the only rule of faith and encourage habits of argumentation without immediate reference to the word of God. A talent for accurate and consistent reasoning is certainly of great value, but it is of much greater to be mighty in the scriptures. Every sentiment which does not perfectly harmonize with the scriptural mode of expression must be viewed with a jealous eye. And if it does not correspond with scriptural principle, it must be treated as an intruder into the system of theology. That notion, therefore, of atonement, which separates the fact of Christ's death from the other effects of the mercy and grace of God, and holds it up in its detached form as an abstract object of speculation, in which believers really have no more concern than any other creature under God's moral government, we must treat as an entire stranger to our theology. It may be the child of ingenious theory, of a cold and false philosophy, but we have not so learned Christ. Christianity excludes from her system such a notion. She embraces as her own that atonement which is both the effect and evidence of sovereign grace, of unequaled love, of infinite mercy, and which is inseparably connected with the salvation of every individual for whose sin it was rendered and accepted. An atonement which expiates his own personal guilt and offense is the foundation of the believer's joy. The great love wherewith he loved us, who is rich in mercy, and hath quickened us together with Christ, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That Christ died in order to expiate the sins of his elect we have already proved. First, from the unity of the divine counsels. Secondly, from the nature of the atonement. Thirdly, from the economy of the covenant of grace. The doctrine is also supported, fourthly, by the uniform tenor of scriptural assertion. When the death of our Redeemer is mentioned or referred to in the oracles of God, it is, in such connection, as shows that it was designed as a benefit only to those who shall, in fact, derive benefits from it, and that the atonement was accordingly made only for those offenses which we have, in fact, been pardoned. But we must here appeal to the reader's own knowledge of the sacred scriptures. It would subject us to the labor of transcribing a greater part of the Bible, were we to quote every passage which supports our doctrine. We shall only give a specimen, state arguments, and subjoin references. John 10, 15, quote, I lay down my life for the sheep, unquote. Verse 18, no man, shall take it, uh, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Verse 26, ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. Verse 28 and 29, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and none is able to pluck them out of my Father's hands. In these words, the Redeemer himself proclaims the fact of his expiatory sufferings and describes the very persons for whom he rendered the atonement. His death is a voluntary sacrifice, in obedience to that law, by which he is appointed mediator. The human life which he assumed was at his own, disposable, oh, at his own disposal and agreeably to the establishment of grace, under which he acted. It was willingly offered for those who shall in fact believe, who shall never perish, who were given to him of the Father to be redeemed and admitted into everlasting life. He suffered death for the election of grace, and for their sins, and for their sins only, excuse me, did he make atonement. All others shall be punished in proportion to their sins, because their offenses are unexpiated. They deserve punishment, and justice gives them what they deserve. He asserts the fact, I lay down my life. His obedience unto death was perfectly voluntary. I lay it down of myself. The fact cannot be otherwise accounted for. He is himself the creator and governor of all creatures. The Father himself had no power over him but what arose from his voluntary humiliation. None in heaven or on earth could deprive Jesus Christ of life against his own will. No man taketh it life from me. Man is a supplement by the English translator. The expression is, none taketh it life from me. Earth, hell, heaven did not take the life of Jesus from him. He laid it down of himself. He had authority over his own life to dispose of it in this manner. I have power to lay it down. The creature has no right over his own life. He did not give it. He cannot preserve it. It is not his own. Our life belongs to God. No man has a right to take away his own life or to lay it down for the life of another. But Christ's life was his own. He, voluntary, he voluntarily assumed our nature. He is the Lord of life. All creation is at his disposal, disposal, whether life or death, or things present or things to come. No parallel can be found in the universe to, sub, to the substitution of the life of the Savior for the sinners, 
and analogies here rather obscure than illustrate, unless it be an illustration by contrast. He had power not only to lay down his life, but also to take it again. This right, which the Word made flesh, had over his own life as the Son of Man, he exercises, not indeed in an arbitrary manner, but according to that law which constituted him the head of the election of grace. He laid down his life in obedience to law. This commandment have I received of my Father. Appointed of God in the system of grace to redeem lost men, he who thought it not robbery to be equal with God took upon him the form of a servant and said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. The establishment of grace constituted the obligation under which the Redeemer laid down his life. Let us then consider the death of Christ clothed with these circumstances and inquire for whom did our Redeemer suffer. We shall ascertain from his own reply the extent of his atonement. I lay down my life for the sheep. Christ's sheep to himself well known are those for whom he made atonement. This is plainly asserted. We confess, however, that it is not generally believed. Many of the Jews who heard the Savior teach this doctrine said in verse 20, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? And we are fully aware that the same charge shall be advanced against us for repeating this doctrine. Be it so. This shall not at all affect its truth. The atonement which the Redeemer did, in fact, make by laying down his life, which he willed to make, which he had a right to make, and which the Father commanded him to make, was for the sheep. This is a specific object. It is one contemplated by the Father and by Christ. The appointment, the power, the will, and the fact, all the circumstances of Christ's atoning sacrifice have respect to the sheep. Who are the sheep? He who knows them well answers this question. They are those very persons who shall, in fact, be saved, who believe, in whom Jesus has a special property, who were given to him by the Father when appointed to be their Savior. These are the ransomed of the Lord, predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. These are the sheep of Christ, distinguished in his purpose of grace from others in the world. Let not our adversaries in sentiment be wroth with us. It is not we, but he that makes the distinction.